had to sign a non-disclosure agreement because he knew how to make Fraunhofer's glass, broke the agreement, and ended up providing all the optics for the great American refractors that I'll talk about in just a minute. And then Thomas Grubb was an engineer. Some of these people were uh, industrialists, and they almost lost their companies because they were so interested in astronomy that they spent money they made from other things doing the uh, astronomy. But uh, Thomas Grubb made great mechanical instruments. In particular, he solved the problem of supporting the mirror. So all these little support points allow the mirror to float without flexing. Very critical part of, uh, of the telescope today. Now let me just stop for, or pause for a minute and uh, talk about the implications of all the astronomical discoveries. So what I've done here is take the reigning picture of a worldview, you might call it, of the day, and convert the linear size of the universe into dollars and cents. So Aristotle's universe was the size of the orbit of the moon, and that's worth three cents on my scale. Copernicus went out to Saturn, that's worth two dollars. Kant, with his discovery, his reinterpretation of the fuzzy patches, uh, got us up to whatever that is, twenty trillion dollars, something like that. Einstein made a little bit of an increase uh, with his uh, theory of general relativity. Uh, by um, 1980, with the discovery of dark matter and so forth, the number had grown to this value with many zeros. And today, we think the number is up around uh, uh, this number in terms of dollars and cents. Now, what I want to point out is that this number compared to this number is not such a great jump as this number compared to this number, okay? So in 1750, the great leap that the universe is huge and that we don't really have the right picture of what we look like in the universe and what our place is was firmly uh, established. Of course, nobody believed him. Who could believe this? But he was right anyway. Speed, light travels at the speed of light. It's constant. And if you see further because the universe is bigger, then the universe has to be older because the light had to travel from the extra part of the outside part of the universe to the inside. So this is a comparable uh, uh, table of ages of the universe. Thanks. <coughs> um, the number, the 6,000 years that you hear so much about, is a relatively recent, 1825. Um, QVA discovered fossils in 1825 and characterized them as having four possible origins, one of which was that they might have been extinct. Right? So the concept that had gone extinct from an old universe didn't exist at that time. It was an original thought. And then this just shows the run-up of the age of the universe according to the, to the scientists of the day up to our current value of about 14 uh, billion years, all because of the size of the universe and that because of the use of the telescope. So this is why I say our concept of where we sit in the universe and how big the universe is was completely uh, upset by the telescopes. I have to speed up a little bit here. I mentioned in the beginning the problem that you put an observatory in a situation. It's got an atmosphere, it's got an altitude, it's got frost, mist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't until 1850 the people, or 1840, the people finally decided maybe they should just move the telescopes down to some place where it was clear. So that was a great improvement of this time of the year, of this time in, in uh, history. Um, the next big telescope, also built for the purpose of finding out what the galaxies were, was built by Lord Ross, uh, 1845. Many of you have seen the famous sketch that I'm going to pop up now. This is 72 inches, and it's another factor of two. Little factors of two make a difference. That's why one person can make such a huge difference in the world. Right? Uh, just a factor of two. So this is one of the things about seeing. The atmosphere blurs the images. That's called seeing. And Lord Ross, who was a very wealthy man, you'll see that in just a minute, uh, built a telescope between two walls because he thought if he could just damp down the air flow, that the mirror would the uh, air would be stable above the glass, and he'd be able to get good images. He didn't succeed at all in that, and this telescope gradually fell to the ground, but has now been reinstated um, 
in, uh, in England by one of his successors, the seventh Earl of, of Ross. He had to, he, now this is a very wealthy, he's a landed gentry, he's a farmer basically. He had to re-engineer, he had to do a much better job of supporting mirrors. He played around with the, the current modern trend in telescopes called segmented mirrors. He, I'll show you one of those in a minute. He played around with that idea. Finally settled on a big single 72 inch blank. He built a steam engine <laughs> to, to rub, a, rub the mirror down so he could polish it. He did all these things himself. Um, and still kept his estate running. This is his big discovery. Uh, this is out in the, in the hallway, it's uh, M51. And uh, he's the first one to have noticed the spiral structure associated with starlight from, from uh, this galaxy. Now when you see a picture of a galaxy, it's always a spiral galaxy. This is 1845. Um, this was interestingly picked up by Van Gogh. So you've all seen this picture. And now if you look at these two together and realize that uh, this picture was floating around in London at the Royal Society and uh, Van Gogh went there once in a while, you can see that the, the vision of the spiral in the sky is what Van Gogh was picking up. And this is a modern picture of that taken with the Sloan, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This, it turned out he observed for one month, the telescope was finished March 1st, it was cloudy that month. This is up in Ireland. Who'd build a telescope in Ireland? Um, it rained all month, and he finally got to the telescope in April, made this discovery, and the Irish potato famine hit. He had 500 employees that he had to take care of, so he let the telescope go to rest for 10 years. And when he came back to it, he observed a few objects, and that was it. Now, one of the great ironies of the story is that they're still, he's still working by eye. The reason this couldn't be seen before was that your eye can only look for a sixteenth of a second, and then it forgets everything. You can't add up the photons like you do with a long exposure on a camera, or we do in astro uh, astronomy with telescopes. Um, and you simply have to have a big enough telescope to get in enough photons to your eye in a sixteenth of a second to make it work. So that's why that factor of two uh, was so important. I don't know if you can see this picture very well, but these are the stables. Right? I mean, it looks like a college building. These were, these were the stables at his estate. And this is a photograph taken in 1858 of those stables. Now, the photographic plate has been used in astronomy for 100 years, 110 years. Uh, he and his wife were photographers. They took pictures of all the people on the estates and so forth, but somehow, it never happened that they actually tried to adopt that to the telescope. So we lost quite a few years um, in that. Uh, just a brief story, I call it Ashes to Ashes, which you'll appreciate. And if you're a, somebody who works in a company that has committees, you'll appreciate this story. Um, the pundits set out to build the best reflecting telescope in the world, put it at the best site in the world, et cetera, et cetera. And this was going to truly reveal how the universe uh, was made. So uh, all the great men of the time, the, uh, Ir the royal astronomer, Airy, uh, I mentioned Lord Ross, James Naismith, uh, who built a wonderful new kind of telescope. Um, many, many people, I, some of you, if you know, if you read popular astronomy, know the names Gunn, Ostriker, Schmidt, Osterbrock, and Faber. This was a committee of that nature. And in 1850, they all got together and agreed on what the best telescope in the world um, would look like. It would use a metal mirror, because that's what they had all used. Um, it would have a cylinder, the tube that keeps the secondary and the primary mirror apart, that was uh, fretwork. It wouldn't be solid, because you had to have, their view was you had to have airflow across the mirror to keep from disturbing the air and so forth. Had to have two mirrors so you could be, have one metal mirror in the telescope while you were polishing the other one, et cetera, et cetera. All the best ideas went into this telescope. It was delayed by 15 years by the Crimean War, and the Britain couldn't pay for it. Gold was discovered in Victoria and Australia. The Victorian government agreed to pay for it, and the committee got to work and built the same telescope they had designed in, in uh, 1850. Uh, by that time, there was glass with aluminum or silver on it, 
in, uh, in Paris, 31 inches, not that far away from 48 inches, but it was regarded as too risky. Okay. It was assembled and test tested near Dublin, and they forgot that it's dusty in Melbourne, Australia, and it's not dusty in, Dub in uh, Dublin. So the idea of a fretwork that would just let all the dust cover the mirror never occurred to them. And finally, when you build a telescope, you have to have it uh, rotating on an axis pointing at the pole star. They forgot the pole star would be in a different place down in Melbourne, Australia. So they had to completely uh, rebuild the telescope. Um, the ashes to ashes part, some of you know the last part of it. Um, the uh, first mirror that was cast it was a big mirror, they got the oven too hot, and the building caught fire. They cut the embers down, the ceiling uh, joists, let the building fall to the ground, and kept firing the furnace, so they got their mirror out okay. So that was the ashes.